Gentle listener, I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and fleets of the Warhammer 40k universe. The grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. Now do check out the links in the description for both the sponsors of this video, but also for links to my mythology channel that I run with my daughter, Lightbringer. It's great stuff if you like a good yarn. Now, I shall move on to a swift tale to get you in the mood, then move on to the body of the law proper. But first, a quickie from the sponsors of this video. Raid Shadow Legends, where you too can become a legend. The top mobile game with over 80 million players. It is still unbelievably free to play. With over 800 unique characters and a plethora of evils to defeat, and all alongside the magnificently diverse play modes, PvE, PvP, guilds, and challenges, there is now the Doom Tower. A place where the dregs of the realms were imprisoned for all eternity. Yet the wards are now eroding. The Arbiter cannot maintain control of this horrific prison and its twisted denizens. So it is up to you to clear it out by cracking heads and taking names. But it is not for the weak or frail. This challenging dungeon has bosses that will test your tactics as much as your reflexes. And if you download Raid today, you will gain access to Sun Wukong, the Monkey God. So download the game and log in consecutively for seven days between now and the 27th of October to gain this exceptional God of War. If you scan the QR code, the techno thingy, and start today, you will also gain 200,000 silver, four energy refills, one epic skill tome, and one day of XP boost. Plus the Knight Errant, a phenomenal hero, and an amazing freebie. So join the bold and download Raid Shadow Legends today. The Doom Tower awaits. Chaplain Lucullus walked the corridors of the Fortress of Hera with a heavy heart, for this was to be his final test, his ultimate victory or utter defeat. For today, he had his last throw of the dice, and he needed guidance. He stopped at each plinth and sconce, looking up at the statuary the icons of honor and duty celebrated and he steeled himself for the task at hand. With new vigor, new purpose, he now strode to his destination. Today, he would reclaim a soul for the Emperor. It was rare, but it happened. Chaplain Lucullus found this to be his vocation, his calling. He always found a way. Every now and again, Barely, it was true, but sometimes a neophyte could be assailed by the one enemy they could never defeat alone. Doubt. When the drill masters and other chaplains had tried and failed, they called upon Lucullus. The drill masters would tire the neophyte out, beast them, until they were too fatigued to even think. Then there would be no room for it, for doubt. Yet this had not worked. Some of his colleagues would use fire and brimstone speeches on psalms. They would assault the very core of the neophyte, stripping away every last logical argument the trainee might have. Some would put the fear of the emperor into them, and often this would work. But in these most uncommon of events, when simply everything bounced off, then, and only then, did they call Lucullus. And he had never failed, not once. He always managed to find the embers inside the soul of the victim, and then to fan them back into a roaring flame of faith and determination, of purpose. Yet this time, he had to admit, he was concerned. Never before had Lucullus been with a neophyte for so long, Never before had he looked into the eyes of one and felt his own faith falter. Yet, with Sextus, he had come close. Sometimes there was a man who led the squad, but did so by being 
instead of by shouting or ordering. The kind of man that is not sergeant, lieutenant, or officer, not above any of the others. Yet, they are the very beating heart of the squad. And this was Sextus. He had gone downhill. He had dragged his entire squad down with him. But he said nothing. Never complained, never rebelled. Never countered arguments or sneered at orders. He did nothing whatsoever to cause such a massive effect. He simply lost hope. He attended, but the light had gone from his eyes. His posture was no less tight or disciplined, his balter no less polished or accurate. Yet a black cloud surrounded him, and it then cast its shadows over the rest of his brothers. He had lost his faith. And in the space of just a few scant months, his squad went from sullen to melancholy, and action had to be taken. Lucullus had read the file on his previous encounters, his history. Sextus had been an exemplary neophyte, came from the very best stock, a family of renown, was near the perfect blend of rugged determination and yet supple flexibility. He was everything the Ottomarines needed, now more than ever. Yet, it had been during the Plague War, when the forces of chaos had run rampant across even Ultramar. Sextus had seen combat, had distinguished himself, had personally slain a demon with his bare hands after running out of bots. Yet, this was when it happened, where it started. Despite being victorious, the merest existence of Chaos Neverborn had somehow shattered the man, or so it was thought. But it was not fear. This much was easy to discern. Previous interrogations proved he was no coward, was no deviant or degenerate. He had just lost his faith. Not in the divinity of the Emperor either, but in humanity's ability to win. Lucullus had discussed this with him had delved so deeply into the soul of Sextus that there was not even a single nook or cranny left unexplored. And the neophyte had not resisted or hesitated in all of it. The most deeply personal of questions was met head-on, without flinching, dramatizing, or any form of avoidance. And Lucullus finally had to admit, the boy knew his mind. He believed in the power of the Emperor. Of course he did. Just not in the strength of his subjects. For Sextus was clever. And when he slew what he thought was a Neverborn, he saw that it was inside a human. What many called the possessed. Yet, when the host body was left by this demon, it had a smile on its face. And this is what broke Sextus. The demon did not just dominate this man he wore as a suit. This man had been broken so much that, despite all the horror he had witnessed the demon perform, he had come to enjoy it. He died with a smile on his lips. And so, Lucullus had tried near everything he had ever concocted. He had never had to go to such lengths before. Most would be returned to the light after but one conversation. For Lucullus was indeed a shepherd of the soul. He knew what made his people tick, so he could fix them. Yet with Sextus, he had explored every last avenue he had ever invented. And now, at the last, he felt almost defeated. When he went back into his furthest meditations, when he thought on his first days of his chaplaincy, he found it. That last gambit, the greatest of cards to play. If this did not work. Then Sextus could not be reached, and Lucullus would have failed. Let down himself, his chapter, his primarch, his emperor, and his entire race. And so... It was with butterflies in his stomach for the first time in centuries that Lucullus knocked on the door of Sextus. They travelled in utter silence, 
Helms attached, armor on. They never even made eye contact. The neophyte did not even ask to know where they went. He was so lost. Even when they marched to a transport, even when they went into high orbit and took to a new conveyance, even when they spent three days flying through the cold darkness of the void, neither spoke. In any other, Lucullus would believe this petulance, or some form of line in the sand that the neophyte could not cross now that they had drawn it themselves. But it was not. Lucullus could see it in Sextus's eyes. He did not ask where they were going, as he simply didn't care anymore. When the ship approached a smaller moon, Lucullus stood and beckoned to the neophyte to join him. The two stood and looked out of the forward view panel, and the pilot was under very specific prearranged orders. He did his job to perfection, for the moon was cleared, and there she was, with a hundred vessels around her, transport, supply ships, escorts, cruisers even, each dwarfed by her majestic bulk, the marines, both chaplain and neophyte, looked on as their ship went down the very length of her, far enough to see her size, close enough to witness her grandeur. And they both basked in the vision. One of the greatest ships to have ever sailed. She was over a score of miles long, a wonder of technological power, one of only a handful ever made. They both witnessed the full splendor of the MacRag's honor, the flagship of the Primarch, the Gloriana-class battleship. Lucullus did not even look at his ward as they docked. He did not speak as he walked with Sextus the nearly thirty kilometers of its grand processional, the central corridor that ran the entire length of the vessel. The two walked in silence witnessing all about them. The banners of old glories, the servitors, technicians, marines, serfs, and stations they passed. When they finally got to the very prow of the ship, again, Lucullus did not speak as he walked to an access hatch. He opened it, and he began to scale a ladder, and the neophyte followed him. Both climbed for over two hours up this one tunnel, until they came out into the blackness of the void. And there, Lucullus offered his hand to Sextus to assist him out of the hatch, but also to position him. As the two stood at the top of the prow of the MacRag's honor and looked down its length, the chaplain then turned and looked up and out at the sun blazing in the distance, and Sextus mimicked him. But he moved slowly, carefully, he was in awe. Lucullus opened his calm and said, This vessel was forged at the command of the Emperor, gifted to our Jean Sire, the Lord Commander, when both walked amongst us. We have kept her hale and hearty, yet never demurred from her deployment in all of the years from then until now. For ten thousand years, Sextus. Sextus. Tell me again how we are doomed. Tell me again how we cannot win. Tell me again from this holy place. Tell me we are not worthy of the Emperor. And if you can, if you can do that, here, before that which you see, if you can do that, then right here, right now, we take off our helms and jump off into the darkness of the void. And at that, the neophyte nodded. He turned back to the ship and basked in its glory, solely taking one knee as he stated, I cannot, in the name of the Emperor, in this holy place, will you give me the final vows? And thus, Lucullus began the litanies, and Sextus became a space marine. 
and not one moment from that second until his last. Did he ever doubt again? And today, we shall again take a walk back into antiquity, or so most would think at the least. For today, we shall be discussing some of the largest vessels that have ever graced the cold darkness of the void. Myths from the ancient times of the Great Crusade and Horus Heresy, more than 10,000 years ago. They were not only self-propelled bastions of colossal size and scope, Fire platforms capable of reducing fleets and even whole planets to atoms. They were also, more than anything, statements of purpose, evidences of authority, blatant and flagrant exhibitions of power. The mere sight of one would cow entire systems before a shot was fired. The presence of one amongst a fleet would make it feel invincible. The visions of them cutting through space, annihilating enemies of the Imperium with a single broadside. The stuff any propagandist would weep with joy to have at their disposal. Of course, I can only be speaking of the Gloriana-class battleships. Now the issue with understanding and enjoying the Warhammer universe is always that of scope. Yes... There are universes where there are larger ships and constructions. Of course there are. But for such a long-standing setting, growing in popularity every day, it can be intimidating to truly grasp the cold horror of the sheer size involved. And few things epitomize this more than the behemoth flagships of the Explorator fleets, the massed forces of the Primarchs and the Legions. Each was unique, bespoke, and had vastly different capabilities, yet each was a statement as much as a weapon of war. For nothing could ever witness a Gloriana-class battleship and not understand the depths of conviction that caused its genesis. To make such a weapon, such a vast construction without any beneficial purpose, the expenditure of so many resources, such manpower, such technical knowledge and endeavor, purely to make a warship, purely to destroy? Countless races must have seen the appearance of one, at the center of thousands of escorts, cruisers, battle barges, frigates, transports, and with that one image, they would have known their doom was encompassed, that there was nothing they could do to stop this thing from destroying them. The thing being the mentality, the people who went to such efforts to wage war. A conviction so deep, a fanaticism so ingrained, that no call to parley, surrender or terms would be acceptable. Anyone who could make such a thing, their only goal was the total eradication of everyone who was not them. And it is not only in the sheer size but the efforts taken to present such a terrible outline of a weapon. They were festooned, positively dripping, with iconography, architecture, imagery, that had no benefit whatsoever. It could not protect them from harm, could not make them more effective or efficient killers. To look upon the Gloriana class, like most ships of the Imperial Navy, is to look into the mind frame of its creators. Each was a work of art as much as a glory of design and engineering, each a dark mirror into the bruised and betrayed soul of humanity. Each was a terrible declaration to the universe. We are coming, and we will give no respite, we will give no terms, and we will give no quarter. Now, let us discuss their history, dimensions, purpose, and power. The Gloriana battleships were always few in number, created in the Sol system almost exclusively. Each of these Goliaths were bespoke and one of a kind, unique. For they were to be more than just massive ships. They were the personal conveyances of the Emperor's sons, 
his Primarchs, the leaders of his Legiones Astartes, the Space Marines, the Gloriana class, as much as the Marines themselves, were symbols. Constructed in the Ring of Iron, around the home world of the Adeptus Mechanicus on Mars, or on high dockyards orbiting Saturn and Jupiter, they were forged over years, sometimes over a hundred, but they proved to be fundamental life's blood during the Crusade. Each was over twenty kilometers long, the largest near thirty. They were islands plowing through the void, entire communities in space, all with the one purpose, the one goal, utterly unified in the conviction of their cause. They were here to free humanity from its enemies and to avenge them. They were capable of maintaining and even producing war gear for the legion they homed. They would have a crew far in excess of half a million men and women, and that would be just a skeleton. In some cases, many more. Their capacity to barrack their marines was legendary. Their firepower, a thing of terror. For in the galaxy, there were so few things, then or now, that are anywhere near their scale. The Abyss class, a trio of fell ships of the word bearers, the Phalanx, home of the Imperial Fist, Bucephalus, or the Imperator Somnium, both flagships of the Emperor, but I have yet to track down their exact dimensions. And this is a point of the Gloriana as well. For lengths are given, but not as many details as I would like. Yet to consider the size of just the standard battleships of the Navy, one could spend months walking its corridors and hunched in its crawl spaces, bays and inner workings, and you may not have seen it all. The Gloriana class ships were not just huge, they were near impregnable. They had tens of meters thick armor, overlapping void shield batteries, and should enemy fire breach these shields, punch through the armor in a segment of the vessel, then nearly any weapon below that of a Blackstone Fortress, or perhaps a Nova Cannon, would merely cripple a segment of it. The damaged region would simply be void cleared to stop the fires and locked off from the hole, and the ship would continue on, firing, killing, destroying everything in its path, everything in its range. Nor were they the kind of vessels that are seen in the 41st millennium, not usually for they were all the cutting edge of the technology of the Crusade. Anyone coming from a ship of the line to one of these colossi would be suffocated by shock. The difference in technological skill, the scope and reach of human power. The weapon systems of each of them was, again, unique and deadly. Entire Xenos fleets could be crippled by one volley from such beasts. Planets could be burnt to a cinder then cracked if they continued the punishment. And the Imperium cannot match them, cannot ever make their like again. As with many things with the Marines, the First Legion was the one to receive their first ship, and it was the largest. So now, let us go through the Gloriana-class ships that are known. The Invincible Reason The home of Lionel Johnson and his Dark Angels the fighting first. Quoted as being 28 kilometers long, it played key roles in the heresy. It was the prison of Conrad Kurz when he was captured. It was at the prow of the Dark Angel's fleet when they cut through the ruin storm, and it was present at the shattering of Caliban. Still active today, as far as I can tell. The Pride of the Emperor. The home of the Third Legion, Emperor's children, and their Primarch Fulgrim. The ship was a wonder of machinery and mind combined to bring about sublime perfection. The fabricated General of Mars himself is reported to have worked on it personally, and it took twice the time to make as any other of its size. Far more decorative and imposing than most, it was bedecked with statuary filled with finery of every form. It also was a place where the Legion fell. La Fanice was in its belly, but that is a tale we should get to soon. It was crippled in the battle where Fulgrim struck down Raboot Gilliman. Yet, 
it is still believed to be active. The Iron Blood. Unsurprisingly, the home of the Lord of Iron, Perturabo, Primarch of the Fourth Legion, the Iron Warriors. Some reports state that it was actually made outside of the Sol system, at the orbital dockyards of Olympia, the world where Perturabo had been sent. And said reports state that it was Perturabo himself who designed it. Hence they tout this as the oldest and strongest of the Gloriana class. Whether that is true or not is another matter. Forged to be as rugged as the Legion and Primarch it served, Spartan to the extreme. Perturabo is said to have covered every last window in the vessel for a period. The prosaic Lord of Iron relying on Auspex scanners alone. This changed, of course. Yet, it was another tiger in the night. It fought against a hard migration, was at the Istavan system when the Horus heresy began. Going on to clash with the Imperial Fist at Fall, and then the Siege of Terror. It is thought to still be potentially active, awaiting the return of its Dark Master to take it back into real space. The Swordstorm Home of the Warhawk Primarch Yagatai Khan and his White Scars It was undeniably the swiftest of all its cars. When it was gifted to the Primarch, he was unimpressed. To the White Scars, to the Great Khan, the steed was as important as the rider, as it always was on Togoris. The Khan moved like the wind, and he expected his ships to reflect that. Hence he gave new specifications of his own making, and the ship was rebuilt. Its speed and power permitted it to break the siege of the Alpha Legion at the Chondak system. Yet the Khan was always a man of action and perspective, and he knew when to trade for advantage. Thus, he used this flagship in an attempt to trap the Primarch Mortarion. It was destroyed, but Mortarion was not slain. Potentially a waste. Yet, if it had worked, if it had worked, much as risked in war, the trade would have been more than worthy of the stake. The Hrafenkel, the home of the Sixth Legion, the vessel of the executioners of the Emperor, the Volka Fenrica, the Space Wolves, flagship of Lehman Russ, it was one of the most potent of the class. A monster even amongst its peers, it was up there with the largest and most lethal. As one would expect, it was a mountain of mass that Russ used as a scythe to sweep away his enemies. It was also the conveyance of Russ when he invaded and crushed a thousand sons on their homeworld of Prospero. And it was the spear tip that was used to plunge into the fleet of the traitor Horus when Lehman Russ boarded the Vengeful Spirit and attempted to end the heresy with one fell swoop. Alas, this did not happen. The Eternal Crusade The anomaly of all its class, because it was not the flagship of its legion. The Eternal Crusader was gifted to Rogel Dawn, Primarch of the Seventh Legion, Imperial Fist. Yet Dawn already had the Phalanx. It was an ancient vessel of Dark Age of technology design, far larger than even the Hulking Glorianas. Rogel had discovered and reclaimed it before ever the Emperor found him, so the Emperor allowed Rogel to keep it. Hence, the Eternal Crusader was not the home of the Imperial Fists, as the Glorianas were. Yet, since the Horus Heresy, it has become one of the most storied ships of them all for the Eternal Crusader is the home of the Scourge of the Unclean. It is the capital ship and home of the Eternal Crusade of the Black Templars. And thus, in the future, it shall get an entire entry of its own. The Nightfall Home of the Eighth Legion and their Dark Master Conrad Kurz of the Night Lords reported to be forged from a working STC pattern discovered during the Great Crusade. It was the center of the darkness that progressed from the advent of the Night Haunter himself. It saw action all throughout the Crusade, then at Istvan and further, and it was the center of the Thramas Crusade. 
a campaign designed to drain the strength of the Imperium. It was brought to a conclusion by the Dark Angels. Facing total fleet and legion annihilation, the Nightfall was used along with a rear guard to stall the Dark Angels' fleet. It had an oddly noble end, sacrificing itself for the future of the Legion. The Red Tear, the home of the Ninth Legion, Blood Angels, the sons of the Angel, Sanguinius. Possibly only second in beauty behind the pride of the Emperor, and only in some people's estimation. Like its master, the Primarch Sanguinius, it was exquisite, but astonishingly powerful. Built in the shape of a tear, with a city-like sprawl in its wider rear, a dangerous prow designed to destroy. The Red Tear had a huge transparent dome above the seeming city at its rear. Graceful but doomed, it had a hard history. Crashed into a planet during a trap set up by the War Master himself, Horus wanted Sanguinius dead above all but the Emperor himself. Yet, it was dragged off that world and reconstructed. Alas, it seems to have been destroyed in the scouring as far as I can tell, for it is certainly not active today. The Fist of Iron The home of the Tenth Legion, Iron Hands, Bastille of the Primarch Ferris Manners. Workmanlike and lean, it had little of the ostentation of the others of its class. Some still, but far less. Yet it was a robust ship even amongst its peers. It saw the end of the Diasporax and was the place where Fulgrim attempted to sway Ferris to chaos. It was near destroyed when Fulgrim was rebuffed and he enacted his treacherous emergency plans. Yet Fulgrim showed a tiny slither of restraint in the name of their friendship, and he did not destroy it at that time. The Fist of Iron was so mauled it was not the flagship of Ferris when he led the Loyalist forces to Istvan, where he was slain by his best friend, his brother Fulgrim, in the Urgal Depression. The Conqueror Home and gladiatorial pit of the Red Angel, the Primarch of the Twelfth Legion, World Eaters. As a home of Angron, it was a beast of a machine, one of the largest and most deadly of all, its Ursus claws being its main horror, grapples that were shot through prey ships to drag them in closer for subsequent boarding. The Conqueror was used to burn a bloody tear across the galaxy, as the World Eaters spared none. Their carnage was unbelievable, unjustified, and unrighteous in the extreme. So much so, that they were censured even before the events of Istavan, even before the Dropsite Massacre, the Siege of Terror, the entire heresy. Then the Scouring as well, for it has endured. Passing from one lord to another over the millennia, often in the Eye of Terror, it featured in the Twelfth Black Crusade, and seemed to be at the disposal of Abaddon the Despoiler. Yet now, it has come back again. But this time, it has returned to the ownership of its rightful lord. Angron, the demon primarch of Corn, and the greatest eater of worlds. The Macrag's Honor Flagship and home of the 13th Legion, Ultramarines. The seed of the Avenging Sun, Rebute Gilliman one of the largest and most complex of all the Gloriana-class ships. A marvel of ceramic construction, it was near destroyed at the betrayal of Kalth. Yet it was repaired by the ever-efficient Ultramarines of the glittering realm of Ultramar. It survived the Horus Heresy and the Scouring, as much of the Ultramarine strength was left to defend the Imperium. Being the linchpin of strategic naval power in the region, the fleets of Ultramar have always had it to augment their force. Used in the Terran Crusade, when the Primarch Arisen, the Avenging Sun, attempted to return to Holy Terror to commune with the Emperor. For a short period, it fell into the hands of evil, traitor Space Marines. Yet it has been retaken and now leads the fleets of the Indomitus Campaign, Master and Flagship reunited after over ten millennia. And it is the brightest sword in the Imperium skies. The Endurance Home of the Pale King, Mortarion, Primarch of the 14th Legion, Death Guard. 
stark, unlovely, and workmanlike, reflecting the soul of the legion it carried. It had no adornment either, bar one eagle and a single mighty skull on its prow. It was where the Primarch finally fell to chaos and bent the knee to Grandfather Nurgle. It survived not only the Siege of Terror, but the entire scouring. Yet it has been transformed by the evil it carries and is a massive plague ship now. It exists today at the center of the Death Guard's fleet during the Plague Wars and beyond. The Fotep Home of Magnus the Red, Primarch of the 15th Legion, Thousand Sons. A mammoth of war to be sure, but also, for a short time, a seeming light in the darkness. Like the Library of Alexandria, it contained every scrap of knowledge the Legion captured during the Crusade, a repository of knowledge both temporal and spiritual. The home of the Thousand Sons was a scholar's dream as much as a martial powerhouse. It was saved from destruction by the Primarch Magnus when the Space Wolves came to destroy him and Prospero and all on it. It fought in the Solar War during the climax of the Horus Heresy, breaking into the Sol system itself. The Vengeful Spirit The dreaded home of the Arch-Traitor, Horus Lupercal, War Master of the Imperium, and then Chosen of Chaos, the flagship of the 16th Legion, Sons of Horus. The ship where so many turned to evil, brought over to Chaos by Horus. The ship which led the campaign to crush the Loyalists and carve its way to Holy Terror itself. One of the most potent and huge of all, it was the twin of another ship given unto the first Captain Abaddon. Yet, it also witnessed the degradation of Horus and then his final death, but only after the arch-traitor to all of humanity slew Sanguinius and then maimed the Emperor of Mankind himself. It is said that the spirit of Sanguinius resides there still, trapped by the pain and suffering there. Yet, even after this, it went on. The vengeful spirit is the capital ship of Abaddon the Despoiler, the Chosen of Chaos. It has been instrumental if many of the Thirteen Black Crusades was present at the destruction of Cadia, and now is the flag of Abaddon, as he brings together the keys of ancient terror with his Arcs of Omen. If the auspex show this vessel on your scopes, no, you are already dead. The Harbinger of Doom Previously known during the Crusade as a Magna Tyrannis, it was the flagship of the first captain of the Sons of Horus, Ezekiel Abaddon, who later was dubbed the Despoiler. The ship, like its twin, has been a scourge for the Imperium throughout all of the days since the First Black Crusade. The Fidelitas Lex The home of the first heretic, Lorgar Aurelian, Primarch of the 17th Legion, Word Bearers. The flagship that saw the fall of the first Primarch, evil whispered into his ears by his underlings, his misguided faith in the divinity of the Emperor, a source of castigation and chastisement. He went mad, and turned to any who would truly need his faith. Fidelitas Lex fought in the Shadow Crusade and the betrayal at Kalth, but it was destroyed by Rebute Gilliman, who sent waves of smaller vessels at it, a death of a thousand cuts, or the lumbering Goliath could not react. It was sunk, and fell into the seas of New Syria. Another Gloriana was attributed to the word bearers, the Chronicle of Ashes, but it was taken by the Loyalists, then eventually given to the Nemesis chapter. The Flame Wrought Home to the 18th Legion, Salamanders, and flagship for the Primarch Vulcan. Alas, I know little of this ship and its exploits, for Vulcan does a large amount of wandering about after his death at the Dropside Massacre. It is presumed to have been destroyed above the skies of Istavan III in the first battle of the Horus Heresy. The Shadow of the Emperor The home of the 19th Legion, Raven Guard, and their sire, Corvus Corax. Still a monster of a vessel, 
but this Gloriana class could tantamount to cloak itself. Using reflex void shields, it masked its energy trails and could operate largely undetected. Alas, no shielding could be raised fast enough to save her. When the traitors opened fire on the planet below, it was mirrored by the fleets. The loyalist ships were outnumbered and bushwhacked at Istvan. The shadow of the Emperor was caught in close range with the terminus est of the Death Guard. And firing unheralded, they sunk her. The Alpha and the Beta, twinned ships that were the home of the 20th, the Alpha Legion, led by the Primarchs Alpharius and Omegon. They were complex ships with confusing internal architecture designed to trap and misdirect any boarding party. The Alpha was involved in the Solar War, the naval assault by the traitors into the Sol system, home of the Emperor. Yet, Alpharius bit off more than he could chew by enraging the cold warrior of Inuit, Rogal Dawn, when he was slain. And then the Alpha Legion fleet simply disengaged, both from the Sol system and from the war entire. Both capital ships have no record of being destroyed, Hence, they may still ply the darkness, waiting for a time to strike. These were the main Gloriana-class battleships that were most famous, and few more existed, like the Amphion, which was the center of Battlefleet Solar for a period. Yet, it was recorded as destroyed during the Zana incursion. So, these were the known Gloriana-class ships. Their like was never replicated. For the Horus Heresy destroyed the industrial and technological base of the entire Imperium. But even if this was not the case, the very nature of the Imperium had changed. The need for such massive statements, such as the Gloriana, was simply not needed anymore. For who would they be used upon to gain the shock and awe they elicited? The Eldar were broken and scattered to the furthest corners of the galaxy. They were no threat. The orcs were culled, as the Elder had done before the fall, and with Alanor gone, there were empires, of course, but they were insular and static and were, again, no threat to the Imperium. Locally, regionally, of course. The wires of the orcs would be a thorn in the side of humanity, but with the exception of the War of the Beast, they were never a real threat. Not until the coming of the Prophet, not until Gazgul. There were no real Xenos empires left to root out and destroy. Certainly no concentration so large as to require the use of a Gloriana class. And even those that were possibly a threat, the Sloth perhaps, all were viewed as minor pockets of resistance that the Imperium would inexorably sweep away in the future. True or not, that would have been the perspective of the time. Even so, there was another reason that nothing of this scale has been approached in all of the time of the Imperium. After the Horus heresy, humanity was, in my humble opinion, broken. They had survived and had that elation. Everything the dark gods of chaos had thrown at them was defeated. But the cost. Not only in manpower, resources, skill and technology. It was all gone. The Emperor was maimed and would never walk among his people again. The Primarchs would all soon leave as well, one by one, after the time of the scouring. The Gloriana-class battleship was a moment in time Freeze framed and made manifest. They were the reflection of the confidence of humanity, its brash self-image that was just so certain that they could and would take the entire galaxy, that they thought that they were invulnerable and invincible and their manifest destiny, an obvious truth beyond questioning. The heresy was the ultimate pin that punctured this conceit. For the Emperor had been betrayed by his most beloved son. Thus, he was not infallible. He was not omniscient. And now, now he was broken. The golden light at the center of the entire project, the Imperium of Man had been broken. And none could even imagine this before the event. Humanity would now play turtle and bunker for the next 10,000 years. 
Oh, there would be the eternal crusade of the Black Templars. There would be counterattacks and crusades of reclamation of zones lost to Xenos empires. Yet, the brash, braggadly spirit that led to the sheer waste of resources that was a glory on a class ship. <laughs> they were gone. The human race curled in upon itself and refused to look out. It blinded itself to the past, yet did not really look to the future. And the Imperium and all of humanity has been on a never-ending spiral down ever since. And the need for the Glorianas was simply negated. Many still exist, many still operational. And in the dark days of the end of times, the Rana Dandra, the Wolf Time, the Primarchs return. And with them come the emergence of these fortresses of the stars. I look forward to their exploits, their battles, and eventually, their end. Only one thing remains that confuses me greatly. Why can I get a deck-by-deck -deck schematic for the ships of Star Trek, Star Wars, or nearly any other sci-fi setting, but not of these, or any other major capital ship in Warhammer? So I say this one thing, not negatively, but provocatively. Come on, GW! You hire one dude with passion and knowledge, you give them a room. You give them a year or two. They come out with the specs, maps and schematics of the ships we all want to know so much about. Get. It. Done. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. Now do check out the links in the description for both the sponsors of this video, but also for links to my mythology channel that I run with my daughter, Lightbringer. It's great stuff if you like a good yarn. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Doodle.